say we get started. So today we will be talking about birds, ornithology. Um, we're going to be focusing on the ecological side of birds. Um, so rather than kind of an in-depth dive into bird biology and bird behavior, this is going to kind of look more at their ecological role in our community and in communities in general. Um, we'll start out with some ecological information, then go into some threats of, uh, that birds face, and then go over a few of the species that we have here in Montana, but not all of them because there's over 400 of those species. So, um, and like all of our lectures, this is a topic that should be a whole semester of a college course. So we're going to try to condense it into an hour and a half. Okay. So what is a bird? Um, all birds share uh, the following characteristics, which is that they have feathers. They have uh, toothless beaked jaws. Um, they lay hard-shelled eggs. They have a four-chambered heart, and they have a strong, lightweight skeleton. Um, and that lightweight skeleton enables them to fly, um, but not all birds uh, are flighty birds. Uh, penguins, kiwis, uh, the dodo, RIP, um, those are examples of some flightless birds. Um, old world birds such as ostriches, rayas, that type of thing, they also don't fly. Um, would be terrifying if ostriches flew. Um, goose teeth. Um, in case you ever wondered if goose and other birds have teeth, they do not. Um, they, these little striations are made of cartilage. Um, so the same uh, material that makes up their beak. Um, and they function the same as teeth, right? They're meant to help break up vegetation, to help grip prey, but they aren't true teeth because they don't have enamel. Um, so it, if you ever come across people that's a fun little fact. Um, so a lot of people think geese have teeth because they've been chased by that at some point in their life. Um, birds are the only known living dinosaur. Um, they are feathered theropods. Um, and you can kind of see from this uh, stem lineage diagram um, list of dinosaurs and then how it diverged into what we have as birds. Um, the closest, closest living uh, relative are going to be crocodilians, so croc uh, crocodiles and their relatives. Um, and for the most part, um, they are considered to be reptiles. Um, some of the uh, shared characteristics, um, you'll notice that birds do have scales. Um, if you look at their feet um, and legs, sometimes you'll see those scales. Um, but yeah, the, the feathers are, are more eye-catching in general, so not everybody notices those. Um, let's look at briefly look at uh, bird anatomy. Um, so you can kind of see the um, diagram of their bones uh, and bone structure. Um, the one that, thing that I want to point out is the keel, which is on the bottom there. Um, that helps support them for flight. Uh, when you talk about old world birds, which are going to be rays, ostriches, emus, um, they are keelless birds, so they don't have that keel. Um, and therefore, they're not supported in the same way, um, which is part of why they're flightless. Um, what we have on here are parts of birds that will help you with identifying birds and kind of help you through this lecture um, when I reference things like crowns and crests, um, beaks, I assume we all know beaks, uh, feet. Uh, the breast is a good marking, and then we also have uh, wing bars which are going to be pretty critical when it comes to identifying birds, um, especially for ducks when you're looking for the white, which we'll discuss on ducks, um, and warblers, or uh, kingbirds. That's not what those are called. No, we're going to, we're going to pretend that, that is, though. Um, we're going to crown kinglets. Thank you. Um, so when we look at the different coloration, the different um, type of feathers, uh, especially in the crowns, um, you can see that it varies during mating seasons a lot. Um, this will be some sort of uh, sexual, sexually dimorphic trait um, used to attract a mate. Um, and a lot of the coloration that you see in birds that's bright and colorful is going to be related to sexual selection. Um, you'll notice that a lot of the birds that are females are going to be a lot more drab, um, which is why a lot of our specimens that we collect from birds back in the days um, are predominantly males because they were more eye-catching and more fun to collect. Um, so
so that's just kind of an interesting little tidbit. Um, and then we also have this uh, these wings diagram. Um, we're gonna have primary wing or primary feathers on the outside. Secondary is more on the inside. Um, and trailing edge is going to be this underwing section here. Um, so that'll be we'll talk about that as well. Okay, so we're gonna talk about species for several minutes. <laughs> So as you can tell, uh, birds have a lot of different species. Um, there's all these different divergences, uh, beginning first with new age bird, or new world birds and old world birds, again, going into the rays versus everything else. Um, how do those species emerge? Let's talk about that. So new species are created through a process of speciation. Um, that occurs when a group uh, within a species begins to separate out and begin on an evolutionary divergence um, into its own species as it develops uh, unique characteristics to that group. So can anybody think of reasons that a new species would begin to emerge? A new niche Yeah. So a new niche to exploit, so that's an area we'll talk about in niche because it's kind of hard to define. Um, but that's perfect. And then anybody else? <coughs> so isolation, sorry. That's just to say if they're cut Perfect. off from the rest of the population. Yeah, so if a, if a species becomes cut off, so if the group of the species, a population becomes cut off from the rest of the group, um, that can create a whole new uh, evolutionary path because if they can't get back to each other to mate, then unique characteristics are going to begin to develop. And that we can de describe as allopatric and sympatric. So allopatric is uh, when new species arrive via a geographic uh, isolation of a population. So there is some sort of physical barrier um, that prevents two uh, groups from mating regularly. Um, and then they follow their own evolutionary paths and become increasingly different over time. Um, sympatric speciation is when a new species arises uh, from a group that is not physically separated, but a group that begins to exploit a different or novel niche. And this is a nice little diagram showing you that. We have for figure A, there's a little barrier there that forms two different species. And then sympatric, the species are together um, and overlapping, but they exploit different uh, niches and opportunities. So when we're talking about species, we have to talk first about evolutionary trade-offs. Um, and when we talk trade-offs, we're talking energy. So organisms have limited energy, and therefore they allocate energy to certain functions, and when they do that, it reduces their energy that they have to put towards other functions. Um, so in other words, they don't have infinite energy. They have to dis decide what to prioritize and what gets kind of uh, lower on the priority list. So some species might put more into obtaining prey, to foraging, to camouflage, to reproduction, um, and others might do a different type of energy allocation. Um, this brings us to the principle of allocation, which is as a population adapts to a particular set of environmental conditions, um, which is talking about our niche, um, they begin to have a uh, increased specialization. And as that increased specialization uh, occurs, it decreases their adaptability to change. Um, so specialization is developed through natural selection um, and through this idea that energy is limited and so specialization is going to help you become the most effective at acquiring and using energy given your particular set of environmental uh, conditions. And that's what optimal foraging theory is, is that because organisms have that limited access to energy, their uh, natural selection is going to favor individuals who are more efficient at obtaining <laughs> and using energy to reproduce. So, how does that apply to niches? Yeah? Are there um, any studies or thoughts about why would an organism remain generalized as opposed to specialized? Yeah. As so, that's a great question. Yeah, so basically, when a species decides to be more generalized, um, they're able to adapt to change. So if they're in an environment that has a high rate of disturbance, um, which we talked about uh, in the past, I think it was our freshwater ecology lecture, 
uh, and we'll go over it again in a couple slides. Um, but if there's an area, if they're in an environment of high disturbance, they're going to want to be really generalized because then they can adapt to many different conditions, um, including human disturbance. So when we talk about animals that live and thrive in cities, those are animals that are generally going to be generalists and who can adapt to change very easily. Um, versus animals that are highly specialized, those are generally going to be more in like preserves or very set, low disturbance environment. Um, so yeah, that's that's why. Okay. Um, good question. So we have niches, um, also pronounced niches. I don't know. I usually say niche, but then I was listening to somebody and he said niche, and now I'm insecure about it. So we're going to go with niche today. <laughs> um, we'll go with niche tomorrow. <laughs> There's no wrong. And words are made up. You know, all of this is made up. Um, okay. So a niche is. See. A niche is the functional role played by an organism within an ecosystem. And so the principle of competitive exclusion says that two species with identical niches cannot coexist indefinitely within the same ecosystem. Um, eventually, one will have better fitness, and natural selection will thus exclude the other. Um, so whichever one is better at converting resources and energy into offspring will be selected for and the other one will be excluded. And that exclusion is either going to result in them being pressed out or their population declining and eventually disappearing. Um, resource partitioning is how that occurs. So when similar species settle into separate ni niches uh, to avoid competitive exclusion, um, that's how they kind of uh, diverge and continue to coexist within the same space uh, because they're not in direct competition. Um, and character displacement is how resource partitioning occurs, which is the uh, species um, undergoes physical changes uh, within a population um, as a consequence of natural selection through evolution. And this reduces competition because they're able to use a different niche in a unique way that no other species in their same ecosystem is exploiting. Um, and the degree of competition, as well as the degree of physical characteristic change depends on the degree of niche overlap. So when we have a sympatric population, which to go over that again, uh, sympatric occurs together. Um, when we have populations that share the same geographic area, that creates a niche overlap. Um, and so characteristics that develop through characteristic displacement, those are going to be uh, much more exaggerated than uh, characteristics that occur in allopatric uh, species. And so you could have the same two species, one occurring in an allopatric zone that has uh, maybe a medium-sized beak, let's say, whereas when you have a sympatric zone, you're going to have a small beak and a large beak. You're going to have very minimal overlap. And it's just through that exaggeration that they avoid exclusion. Um, allopatric. Again, they can reduce that exaggeration because there's no risk of exclusion. Um, a key example of this is going to be Darwin's finches. And I'm assuming a lot of you have heard about them, but we're going to go over them today. So Darwin's finches were encountered during his voyage on the Beagle. Um, and he spent five weeks in the Galapagos Islands. And amongst many other things that he observed, he observed and collected a bunch of little finches from the island. Um, or from the islands. And he wasn't overly interested in the finches. Um, he didn't think that there was a lot of differences. But when he returned to England and showed it to an ornithologist, uh, John Gould, he was actually able to identify 14 different species, uh, 12 of which had never been seen before because they were distinct from the uh, finches that can be found on the mainland of South America. Um, and so, because they're nearly identical, each had a different beak for different types of feeding niches. Um, and that's how they avoided that exclusion, is because each one adapted its physical characteristics to meet their environment through specialization. Um, these were the range, or some of the range. There's not 14 of these up here. But um, you can see how different beaks uh, correlated with different food sources. Um, so 
you have frugivores ranging into insectivores to cactus eaters and into seed eaters. Um, for seed eating finches, which are the four on this side, um, beak depth correlated with body size, and that both of those correlated with the amount of force it takes to open the seeds that were on those particular islands. And so some finches targeted really tough, really large seeds, um, and so those would be the largest birds with the largest and deepest beaks. And others uh, focused on really small seeds that were a little more delicate. Um, and because of that, they tended to have smaller body size, right? Because we're looking for efficient uses of energy. Um, it's not an efficient use of energy for a very large finch to target a lot of tiny little seeds. It's more effective for a small finch to do that. Um, which correlates again with what we've talked about in the past where, you know, I think we talked about it with bats. A large bat is not going to go after a bunch of different mosquitoes. Um, a small bat is going to do that because a small bat can get nutrients from those small mosquitoes. Uh, whereas a large bat is going to go after large beetles, moths, that type of thing, so that they're not expending more energy than they can take in. So back to finches. <laughs> um, this is an example just going over the character displacement um, that we talked about with that graph, right? So we can see this in a real life example. So on Santa Cruz Island, populations were sympatric, so that island in the middle. On Los Hermanos and on Daphne Major, they're allopatric, so they're separate. So the only place where these two different finches that we're studying here, the only place that they overlapped was on uh, Santa Cruz Island. And because on that, uh, because they were sympatric on Santa Cruz Island, we noticed that there um, is a wider distribution. So the um, characteristics are more widely distributed versus a much narrower distribution um, where they did not overlap. So to compare it to a little more clear graph, um, you can kind of see how that real life uh, application occurs with this uh, example. Okay, so we're going to listen to a video for eight minutes so that you don't have to listen to me talk this whole time. Um, this will go over what we've learned in this little lecture so that you can hear it from another person saying other words um, and help you kind of understand it. So he goes into um, some more like uh, symbiosis. symbiosis, thank you, um, which we're not going to be talking about today. Um, but just to give an illustration of MacArthur's warblers, um, this is what he was looking at. So uh, all these different niches exist within this tree because it reaches a certain height. This is an you know, old growth forest um, uh, that has a lot of environmental complexity to it. So we talked about environmental complexity in freshwater ecology, uh, but basically the more complex an environment is, uh, the more niches it has and the more diversity can exist within it. Um, so in this case, we have a lot of available areas within a tree um, and really within the forest in general. Um, and that allows you know, existence without exclusion uh, just through this resource partitioning. Um, so that was a really cool example. Um, does anybody have any questions from the video before we move on? Cool. So we're going to jump into threats to birds, and I'm going to take a drink of water before we do that. So as far as threats go, we have habitat disturbance, uh, degradation, and loss, um, which we mentioned during uh, our wildlife conflict. Uh, window collisions, lead poisoning, avian influenza, and then invasive species. So for habitat. Um, habitat use with birds can vary a lot, especially seasonally, um, when we take into account migration. Um, not all birds migrate. There are plenty of year-round residents, um, especially here in Montana, but a lot of birds do. Um, and so a certain habitat might be used, instead of as a year-round habitat, it might be used as either a breeding area, a mating area, or as a refueling station. 
Um, so when a uh, bird has this refueling area that they remember um, and they can visit yearly, um, it's an area that's really rich in like whatever food resource that they need, so rich in insects, rich in uh, native plants, et cetera, et cetera. Um, they'll return to it over and over again and they'll come to rely on it because migration takes up a lot of fuel um, and a lot of energy. Um, and so if they return to that area and find that it's either been disturbed um, or degraded or lost entirely, that can create a really big problem because you know, they've stretched their energy so far that they don't really have time to go and look for a different refueling station. Um, so this can cause really big problems, as you can imagine. Um, but let's talk disturbance. So with disturbance, um, we talked about it back before, um, but when we see uh, disturbance, especially in birds, the lowest amount of disturbance is going to have the highest uh, richness for native birds. Um, and richness refers to the number of species in a community. Um, Diversity is going to be the ratio of species richness to rate the species abundance, and abundance is the relative abundance of all species. Um, again, we went over that in freshwater ecology. Um, so again, when we have preserves, which are the lowest amount of uh, disturbance, we have higher numbers of um, native birds, both in number of species and abundance. Uh, when we have areas of really high disturbance, we tend to see a lot more invasive species, um, which are species that are generally better adapted to uh, areas of high human disturbance. Um, as you can see on that far left graph, we have a spike right in the middle. Does anybody remember what could explain that? It's something called intermediate disturbance hypothesis. Does anybody remember that from our lecture? <laughs> so, the intermediate disturbance hypothesis or theory states that you're going to have the maximum amount of species diversity um, when you have a medium amount or an intermediate amount of disturbance in an ecosystem or community. Um, and basically that prevents, the idea is that a medium amount of disturbance will prevent um, the best colonizer and the best um, uh, the species that are best at colonizing quickly versus the species that are best at um, taking over an area, uh, such as exploiting its resources over the long term. Um, so we don't want the first and we don't want the last species to take over an environment. And so the idea is that intermediate disturbance will cause a balance between those two um, and allow more diversity to occur. Um, but with native birds, that doesn't really hold true. So when we see that spike, that's just the averaging out of the abundance and richness of uh, high, uh, high disturbance uh, invasive species versus low disturbance native species. So in, in summation, um, low disturbance is better for native species, um, which unfortunately is not the way that our environments are trending. Um, our environments are generally trending towards high disturbance, especially as people continue to uh, develop land and go out for more and et cetera, um, doing more with, with the land. Um, so there's not a lot of areas with that preserved level of low disturbance. Um, so we're seeing species decline through that. Um, we also see species decline through degradation of, it, of habitat, and that can include pollution, um, it can include decreased insect populations, decreased native plants, um, decreased appropriate shelter and nesting areas, um, light pollution, so birds are really sensitive to light, especially during night migrations, and then overuse. If, if areas, especially areas that are you know, important for nesting, if those areas are being used even for just recreational purposes or bird watching purposes, um, that can disturb some really more sensitive species and that can displace them um, and make them not return to that habitat. Um, degradation also includes the introduction of invasive species, especially invasive predators. Um, I think it's something like 50% of uh, bird richness or abundance is decreased when there's a, a certain number of cats present in a park. 
Um, I think it was something like 23 cats were present in the park, and uh, that decreased the abundance by 50%. Um, so just having invasive predators, having um, competing, pred or com competing invasive species that can degrade a habitat for uh, native birds. And then we have habitat loss, which includes development, um, it includes logging, um, it can include forest fires as well. Um, our forest fires these days tend to burn really intensely and frequently, um, whereas our environment is more adapted to uh, frequent low intensity burns. Um, but that's fire ecology, which is not at all my wheelhouse. One day we'll have somebody talk about that maybe. Um, but native birds are adapted to kind of a more uh, original form of fire, which is not being mimicked now. Um, so they're not able to use it in the same way. Then we have glass collisions. Um, so studies have shown that as many as one billion birds uh, per year die from window strikes just in the US alone. Um, this increases drastically during mi migration periods, especially in um, big cities like Chicago and New York City. Um, where we have lit up high rises um, that tend to attract birds at night. Um, birds can be confused by windows, especially windows that have plants behind them um, or reflective windows next to gardens or areas that have vegetation. Um, windows can also be reflective at different times of days and not at others. So you might look at your window at what time, one time of day and think, oh, that's not reflective, they'll be able to see that fine. And then at a different time of day when the light hits it, differently, um, it is reflective. Um, and then strikes are most common in the morning, especially during migration when birds have become tired over migrating during the night and are kind of not on top of their game. And so whenever they see something that looks like some habitat that they could nest in or that they could roost in for the day or just to take a break, um, they might not be as uh, attuned to a window versus an actual proper roost. Um, and so any bird that strikes a window should be taken to a rehabber. Um, we have uh, Montana Wild here in, uh, here in Montana, which is in Helena. Um, they're an awesome rehabber that you can rely on. Um, even if birds fly off, I think everybody has heard stories from somebody who says, oh yeah, if they hit the window, but then they flew off, so they're fine. Um, a lot of the times birds will fly off even if they have internal injuries, so that can include internal hemorrhaging, um, concussions, or damage to you know, uh, certain parts of themselves like bills, wings, eyes, um, skulls, and that either leaves them more vulnerable to predation or makes them unable to feed themselves or to drink water or anything else that's necessary for living. Um, so they should always be taken to a rehabber even if they appear to be okay. Um, things that help avoid glass collisions are gonna be external insect screens. Um, so not only does that create some sort of visual barrier, it also softens the uh, strike. So if they do hit in the window or run into the window, um, they have a little more of a give rather than just going straight into the glass. Um, Pattern glass. Uh, and dimmer lighting, so there's types of stickers that you can use um, that, or decals that you can apply to windows, um, and that helps indicate to the birds that there's something there. It's not just a clear pathway or a reflective area. Um, the markers just have to be close enough, so I think the recommendation is currently five centimeters apart. Um, and certain uh, Stickers or other methods can be, you know, completely unobstructive to your sight inside. Um, there's a ton of options too. People have been really creative. Um, like this is paracords being used. Um, super cheap way to just kind of create a clear dividing line, um, and it's close enough that birds won't think that they can fly through it. Um, and they've blocked out the portion that isn't covered by an insect screen. Um, People also paint their windows, which looks really cool. I've seen some really cool stuff that um, one person did like a tree design, um, but it's not realistic enough for a bird to think that it's actually a tree. Just to clarify. <laughs> um, so yeah, so this is the only anthropogenic threat um, that kills more birds in the US than domestic cats. And anthropogenic means that it's a human-caused uh, issue, as most things are. Uh, next, we have lead poisoning. 
So um, lead poisoning usually occurs through accidental exposure when uh, lead ammunition fragments uh, are left in either gut piles or uh, abandoned carcasses and when lead fishing tackle is broken from the fishing line. Um, lead will accumulate in a raptor system, so because they are predators, um, they have bioaccumulation, which means that when they eat something, it begins to accumulate more and more in their system. So whatever they're eating, like if a fish has high heavy metals exposure, they're eating multiple fish. So they're undergoing a lot more exposure than just an individual fish would have. Um, so that's what we say when we say, you know, bioaccumulation is occurring. So they're not able to excrete the lead, they're not able to um, process it through. Um, and this leads to brain swelling, respiratory distress, um, and a bunch of different neurological issues. So seizures, uh, muscle weakness, loss of vision, loss of coordination, and loss of nerve function. Um, a recent study showed that 47% of bald eagles in the U.S. had uh, chronic lead poisoning, and 33 to 35% had acute lead poisoning. Um, a wildlife center, the Wildlife Center of Virginia, did their own uh, data collection uh, just with bald eagles that they had admitted, um, and it showed that about 75% uh, had lead exposure. 26% uh, of those uh, had elevated levels, and of those 26%, only 5% survived to be released. Um, at that same center, 33% of all raptors admitted uh, had lead poisoning, so it does affect different raptors to a different degree. Um, certain birds are going to be more likely to be exposed through gut piles and through carcasses and through fishing lines. Um, other raptors just have different food sources. so they're not exposed at the same level. Um, so yeah, that's a big problem. We're gonna to listen to a brief video about avian influenza. A new strain of avian influenza has found its way into Montana, infecting and killing both wild birds and poultry. It was first documented here when the waterfowl returned from their spring migration. It is highly transmissible to poultry. If you have a backyard flock, they are at risk, so you need to take precautions to protect them. Avian influenza is a naturally occurring bird virus, but when highly pathogenic like this strain, it can be extremely infectious and fatal to both poultry and wild birds. The uh, symptoms of the avian flu, it won't be obvious until just before death. And this virus attacks the brain, so there will be neurologic symptoms. The bird won't be able to fly, and it may appear to have no control over its bodily movements. So far in the wild, geese, great horned owls, turkey vultures, and other raptors have seen the highest mortality. And while transmission to humans is low, if you do find a dead bird, Take precautions and report. If you find a dead bird, do not touch it with your bare hands. If you find dead birds anywhere out in the wild, uh, especially if there's a number of them, that we would encourage you to report. I'm Winston Greeley, out of Montana's fish, wildlife, and parks. <laughs> So, have any have you guys heard of avian influenza for the most part? Yeah. So, here in Montana, we have exposures um, not only in birds but also spreading to mammals. So that included um, grizzly bears, foxes, um, I believe barn cats. Uh, barn cats, I think, were in Wyoming. I'm sure some cats have been exposed here too. Um, but mostly, it comes when these carnivores, predominantly carnivores, are feeding on. Uh, dead birds that are infected with avian influenza. Um, and so we're seeing more uh, crossing between species and between groups, um, which means that there's more opportunity for uh, mutations and the chance that avian influenza could become more pathogenic and more spreadable or transmissible to humans. Um, so rehabs are having to be really careful, zoos are having to be really careful. Um, at the height of avian influenza, a lot of zoos uh, took their birds inside um, and limited any uh, exposure from people coming in and out of the zoo. Um, any, a lot of the times uh, states would have policies that when avian influenza struck a farm or a backyard farm or any type of, of poultry farm, um, all of the animals would have to be cold and uh, the farm would have to be 
uh, placed on isolation for quite a while. Um, there have been some successful uh, rehabilitation examples of uh, specifically raptors that have been uh, infected with avian influenza. Um, I believe it's been a couple owls and a couple red-tailed hawks, but it hasn't been extensive. Um, and that's both in part that avian influenza is, is highly fatal and also because um, states are being cautious and oftentimes not allowing uh, rehabs to rehabilitate avian influenza. Okay, let's move on to invasive species. Um, so as far as invasive species go, who here has European starlings around their house? Yeah. So starlings uh, were released into Central Park in the 1890s um, by a fan of Shakespeare. Uh, they released 60 starlings because Shakespeare mentioned starlings in his work. Um, and they thought it would be fun to have starlings in the US. Um, so now there's 46 million starlings um, and they are the most common songbird in the US. And they cause hundreds of millions of dollars in crop damage every year. Um, they oftentimes evict uh, native birds from their nests. Um, they can mob native birds and kind of push them out of habitat. And then they can also transmit avian diseases. Um, so they're not great to have around. Uh, rock pigeons and feral pigeons, um, those were brought uh, to the US in the 17th century by European colonists. Um, there's about 8.4 million of them, and they thrive in areas of really high disturbance. Um, so they do great in cities, which shows because they're everywhere in cities. Um, house finches as well. Um, this little map down here shows the original uh, range of house finches, which is western, uh, the U western U.S. down to Mexico. Um, and then house finches went across to a pet store in uh, Rhode Island, I think, and uh, they got released from that pet store because the pet store wasn't supposed to have them, and so instead of being fined, they just released them. Um, and so that created this whole population on the east uh, coast. Uh, and they can outcompete purple finches, which is a, a key issue with them. Um, they're very pretty and they sound nice, so, so they tend not to create the same uh, ire as other like the starling and the pigeons do. Um, also, I recommend that you read the pigeon watching book. Um, it goes into kind of the history of pigeons and a little more about how we've exploited them over the past. Um, and it's a great book. So um, then we have the house sparrows, which were introduced as biocontrol um, to control invasive, or not invasive, but caterpillar populations that were doing crop damage. Um, they tend to drive native species away from nesting boxes. Uh, they can destroy or eggs and kill nestlings. Um, and their nests often cause fire hazards. So they're not great to have around either. There's a lot of them in this area right around the library too. Um, and then ringneck pheasants uh, were first introduced in the 1730s as a game species. Um, they tend to harass other ground nesting birds. Um, and they may engage in uh, brood parasitism, and who knows what brood parasitism is? Is that like the cuckoo bird? Yeah, it's like the cuckoo bird. So yeah, so it's when a bird decides to lay an egg in somebody else's nest and leave the raising of their chick to a different bird. Um, and that's that energy uh, adaption, right? It decides to invest very little energy into uh, raising their young in that they don't raise their young and they invest more energy into um, tricking whatever species they usually uh, engage in brood parasitism with, um, usually with like egg mimicry. So they try really hard to stay ahead of that, you know, evolutionary uh, war with their, uh, with, with whatever uh, species they parasite or parasitize. Okay, and then we have mammals. Um, so we have black, brown, and Pacific uh, rats, which along with house mice, have been gone wherever humans have gone. Um, and they've created a big problem, especially uh, on islands, uh, along with muscolids, so stoats, weasels, that type of animal. Um, because on islands, a lot of animals, especially birds, um, were not adapted towards flight because they had no 
ground predators. Um, so to take New Zealand, for example, the only native uh, land mammal in New Zealand are two little, bird, are two little bats, um, the New Zealand lesser short-tailed bat and the New Zealand lesser, lo or lesser long-tailed bat. Um, and both of those bats are very terrestrial bats. They run along the ground, they uh, will roost in little uh, burrows, as well as more aerial stuff. Um, but, you know, there's a lot of kiwis. Kiwis are ground birds, um, and both the bats and kiwis have been heavily affected by the presence of rats, mustelids, and, of course, cats. There's a rat eating eggs. Um, rats will eat the eggs. They'll eat um, nestlings. Some of them will eat small birds. Um, and mustelids are pretty notorious predators as well. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a really big problem, especially for islands. Um, now we're going to talk about cats for a couple minutes. Um, and this is actually what I have my background in. It's uh, feral cat management um, and feral cat uh, welfare. Um, so to go over what studies have shown us recently is that it's hard to estimate the number of fatalities uh, that are attributed to cats. Um, but our best estimate is somewhere between 1.3 and 4 billion birds per year in the U.S. are killed by cats. Um, 6.3 to 22.3 billion mammals are killed every year. Um, and then the estimates for reptiles and amphibians are even harder to quantify because reptiles and amphibians are hard to have uh, population numbers on. Um, this is just not an area that's been studied very well, the interaction between amphibians and reptiles and cats. Um, we do know that they are predated upon um, by cats, and they have probably some pretty heavy um, effects from that. Um, I can't remember who I was talking to, but it was a university that used to have a lot of snakes and amphibians that would be studied by the uh, ecological department. Um, and then feral cats moved into the campus as a result of people uh, not wanting their cats anymore when they moved out of the dorms or whatever. And then breeding colonies and then cats just populated the university. Um, and they saw all the amphibians and reptiles disappear. And most likely that was a combination of them being predated upon and them deciding that they're going to find a different habitat because of that new introduction of predators. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a big yearly impact. Um, Cats kill both invasive and native animals, so it's not to say that only native birds or only native mammals are being preyed upon. Um, cats do probably control some of our invasive species, um, but they also have a, a, a negative effect on our native animals, and we don't know to what degree that balance is. Um, more studies would have to be done on, on what species exactly are being killed predominantly. Um, cats on islands have contributed to 14% of modern extinctions, um, which is pretty significant. Um, the presence of cats in communities deters birds and other prey animals, which is that study I talked about earlier, um, where in parks where cats are present, there's 50% less abundance of birds. Um, even well-fed fed cats will hunt when outdoors. It's not a matter of hunger as it is uh, just instinct. Cats are really good hunters, um, and that's just part of their instinctual uh, abilities uh, or instinctual behaviors. Um, and so even well-fed, owned cats are going to hunt when they're outside. Um, so it's not just feral cats, it's not just unowned cats, it's also your cats, or owned cats. Um, and then it's also not great for cats, as we've found out through studies. Um, the average lifespan for an outdoor cat is about two to five years. Uh, versus an indoor cat, which is 10 to 15 years. Um, we also uh, have a study that showed that about 75 to 100 percent of mammalian prey in rural areas were native species, um, and in urban areas, uh, non-native mice and, and mammals made up a larger portion. Um, so that study, is, I, I hope, is still ongoing because it would be interesting to see the results of that. Um, and then finally, any cat caught animal should be taken to a licensed rehabber. Um, the issue with cats, uh, cat bites and cat claws, um, particularly cat bites, is that their teeth are very sharp and they're very small. 
Um, and so they act a bit like needles. And so basically they're injecting bacteria that all animals have in their mouth, including us, including dogs. Um, and it injects it basically, and it can create damage that's not as obvious as like a dog bite. Um, I've been bitten by a cat. I had to go to the hospital to get uh, antibiotics because it was much worse than my dog bite, even though it was a much smaller animal and a much uh, less traumatic bite. Um, you know, it swelled up within a couple hours versus my dog bite, which was just like kind of hurt for a while and didn't swell up. <laughs> um, so this damage can be kind of invisible when it comes to animals that are covered in fur or covered in uh, feathers. So when you have a cat caught animal, um, taking it to a rehabber to be evaluated is the best thing that you can do. Um, if I would just assume that whenever you have a cat interaction with wildlife, take it to a rehabber to have it checked out. Um, it's also not great for the cat to interact with wildlife either. There's a lot of transmissible illnesses and diseases, um, including but not limited to rabies. Um, so making sure that cats and wildlife are kept, se kept separate is important. Um, we're going to go over some myths real fast. Um, I actually found most of these myths on the uh, Great Falls Animal Shelter website, which is disappointing to see. Um, cats are not wild animals. Uh, feral cats are not wild. They are unsocialized. Um, they are still domestic animals. There's no difference in species between an indoor cat that's been inside all their lives and was born inside and a feral cat that was born outside and has never been contacted by humans. Um, they are still vulnerable to poisons, to predators, cars, illness, diseases, and any other number of deadly things that can occur to the cat when it's outside. Um, so they're not thriving. Um, to say that they're thriving would be pretty disingenuous. Um, and, and I say this as somebody who worked at a feral cat clinic who saw the injuries that came in. Um, domestic animals are meant to be with humans because they evolved alongside humans. So uh, feral cats are too dangerous to be around people. Um, feral cats are still domesticated, just not socialized. Um, so it's not the same as bringing in like a, a raccoon or a squirrel or something that is an actual wild animal. There is still an ingrained level of domestication uh, within a feral cat. Um, so they're built to coexist with humans or alongside humans to some degree. Um, the critical socialization window with cats ends at about 14 to 16 weeks. Um, that's the point where true socialization can really occur. So if you get a cat that has had absolutely no human contact um, beyond, 16, or beyond 16 weeks, it's unlikely that you're ever going to have a lap cat. Um, but chances are you can still adapt them into a, an animal that can live around you, either in an enclosure or in your house as just a decorative animal. <laughs> Sometimes animals are decorative, and that's OK. <laughs> they don't need to be pet all the time. They just need to be safe and inside. Um, Feral cats cannot be adopted, live indoors, or be contained. Kind of just talked about that, but feral cats can thrive in containment. Um, again, as domestic animals, they do best when they're cared for by humans um, in a human environment. Uh, some animals that have been assessed as feral in shelters or outdoors when you just run across a cat, they turn out to not be feral. They turn out to be reacting to their environment. Um, that's happened a lot. I've you know, personally adopted or adopted out animals that we thought were entirely feral, and a few months later, they're just, you know, on their back, on the couch with you watching TV, perfectly fine. Um, doesn't always happen that way, but it can. Um, feral cats feed mostly on human leftovers, not on native uh, animals. Feral cats are opportunistic, just like any other type of cat. Um, they will eat what is available, including, but not limited to, native animals. Um, all cats need to go outside for their quality of life. Some cats do. Some cats really thrive on outdoor enrichment, um, but that does not mean that all cats need to go outside unattended or unsupervised. Um, there's a lot of really cool ways that we'll talk about in a second to let cats enjoy the outside without compromising either their safety or the safety of the local ecosystem. Uh, adult cats cannot be trained. 
they can with patience and proper technique. Um, not all cats are going to enjoy it. All cats are individuals. That's just what it comes down to. That's why we have multiple options. Um, one thing that I hear a lot is that it's not a problem to have an outdoor cat in the city because there's no wildlife in the city. Um, and us being in Missoula, we can attest to that not being true. But even in huge cities like New York City, Chicago, we talked about that. There are major migration pathways that go through those cities for birds. Um, and so you'll have really rare birds, threatened birds that show up in these cities and that can be preyed upon by cats um, if we allow those really large colonies, really large outdoor populations. Um, I also hear the opposite, where it's cats aren't a problem in rural areas because there's no wildlife in rural areas. Wildlife exists everywhere. Um, it can't be both true at the same time. Um, and then finally, cats don't kill as many birds as pollution and habitat destruction, um, which means uh, that we don't need to worry about it. We need to. And this is, it, it can be true. I mean, cats might not kill as many, as many birds as just the damage that we're wreaking on all these different species from polluting our environment, from destroying habitat. However, it's one aspect that we can control that as individuals that we can make a difference with. By keeping our cats inside, we can reduce, even if it's just a little bit, we can reduce how much pressure is put on some of these more endangered or threatened species. So these are some examples of cool ways. Um, leash training, catios. I am insanely jealous of that catio. It's by a cat scientist. I wish I had it. Um, but if you don't have hundreds of dollars to invest, like I do, like, or I do not have, <laughs> yeah. I'm in AmeriCorps, I have no money. <laughs> um, you can have these little you know, temporary pop-up tents that are awesome um, and super effective. I've seen people bring these camping with their cats as well so that they can have you know, outdoor spaces. Um, or little window patios where you can build just extensions outside of windows and they don't have to be big, it just allows them to sun themselves and enjoy the outdoor enrichment. Um, there's also cat fencing, which goes inward, um, and that allows, uh, or that does not allow cats to jump out. Um, you'll see this type of fencing in zoos as well. Um, it's really good at containing animals, especially cats, um, which are more prone to climbing and eating. Really cheap to install too, you can install it yourself. Um, and it's pretty effective. The only problem with it is that animals tend to leap in from the outside and then get trapped. So you have to make sure nothing gets in and gets trapped. Um, one of my friends has it and she has to check for foxes every day. And then feral cat solutions. So those solutions on the previous slide, slide work really well for owned cats um, and socialized cats, but what works for feral cats? Um, and again, feral cats are unsocialized cats. Um, we can do adoption for our cats. There's working cat programs. Um, the ones that are really effective are the ones that seek a contained home, um, either in like a warehouse, like that cat lives in, uh, a contained barn, um, or something that has barriers. Um, adopting cats out as barn cats um, and expecting them to just live in the area of a farm or a barn uh, with no containment efforts uh, one, it leaves them really vulnerable to predators, um, and two, it doesn't solve that ecological damage that they cause. Um, so having cats contained in barns where you need them, great idea. Um, we also have enclosures. So this example um, is a really cool example that I found on Facebook. Um, that house is a shed that they repurposed into an indoor enclosure for their feral cats and then they have a little tunnel that leads into the big outdoor enclosure. Um, and so they have about four cats living in there, um, and it's just a cool setup. It allows the cats to be separated from people, so they're not undergoing stress from directly living with them, uh, but they have a safe place, um, and they're not eating birds. Um, this under here is the Lanai, Lanai? It's Hawaiian, I'm sorry, I don't know. Lanai, thank you. So this is the Lanai Cat Sanctuary. It's on 3.5 acres, and they use cat fencing to enclose this area. Um, and they work really closely with the Hawaiian bird con uh, conservation organizations. Um, and this is a really cool solution that they found. Um, wish that there was more of it in, in mainland US, um, but there's just not a lot of funding because 
funding goes more towards TNR efforts, which is track meter return. Um, which again, that helps when it comes to reducing the number of cats that are being created within a colony. Um, but it doesn't stop animals or from cats from being introduced into the colony as, as abandoned cats and then growing the colony that way, or uh, preventing ecological damage from being done. So thank you for listening to that. <laughs> I know that that was a lot of feral cat stuff, but now we're on to birds again. We're going to be going over some bird species here in Montana. Um, so in Montana, we have 445 species recorded. Um, I believe that includes rare species as well as incidental or accidental uh, birds that have kind of wandered up into Montana or down, as the case may be. Um, when we go over these birds, I want you guys to pay pretty close attention to the beaks and then the feet um, and those types of adaptions or adaptations that have let them find their niche and let them exploit that area without having overlap um, or without having competitive exclusion. Um, when I started to think about birds in this sense and started to think about what adaptations they had, I had a lot more fun with birding, so I hope the same is, is applies to you guys. Um, but yeah, just take a look. Uh, so let's start with cormorants. So um, these are pretty easy to spot. They're big birds, they're uh, really dark. Um, they kind of remind me of vultures because they just like to spread out and sun themselves on rocks. Um, we only have one species here in Montana. We have the double-crested cormorant, and that comes, the name comes from they develop little crests during the mating season. Um, they are a migratory resident, so they come here for breeding. And they primarily eat fish, uh, preferring slow-moving or schooling species. Um, and so looking at this bird, what do you guys notice about this bird that's a good adaptation? It's feet. It's feet, yep. So it has really big webbed feet. Um, and also they're located really far back on the body. And that's going to make it a really good diving species. Um, what else? Yep. It has a big old beak on it um, that's hooked to help it grab onto fish. And it also has a really expandable throat to help it kind of choke down really big fish and big prey. Excellent. Okay, so this is the spotted-tailed cuckoos. Um, we have two species here in Montana. We have the yellow-billed and the black-billed cuckoo. Um, this is a breeding resident. Um, and it's pretty variable size. It tends to be slender bodies, long tails, um, and then strong legs. Um, and unlike the old world species, this uh, species or this group of cuckoos uh, tend to not be brood parasites. Um, so they will raise their own young in their own nests. Um, and they, their little niche tends to be large insects, especially unpalatable caterpillars. So they'll eat the caterpillars that other birds don't want to eat. Um, and you can kind of see with their beak, it's pretty narrow and curved, but also pretty um, powerful compared to some other insect eaters. Um, and so that kind of indicates that it, it's probably eating bigger insects, as well as its size. Okay, we have 43 species of ducks, geese, and swans. There's a lot of them. Uh, they tend to come in, especially during the winter um, and overwinter here. I had a blast going out in the winter and trying to ID a ton of ducks. Um, and I'm going to teach you some tips on how to ID them. Um, this was pulled from a duck ID guide from Caitlin with the Madison Audubon. Uh, it's just on their website. It's a cool little, just put a lot of work into it, so I wanted to acknowledge her. Um, so dabbling versus diving. Um, dabbling ducks are going to be ducks that stay at the surface and tip their bodies forward, uh, creating that classic little bobbing rump. Um, and they're just kind of filtering out water and grabbing what they can at the surface. Uh, diving ducks tend to dive under the water and pursue prey that's lower down. Um, that includes fish, crayfish, that type of thing. Um, so they'll dive down and pop up somewhere else. So diving versus dabbling. Of course, this being science, nothing is ever exact. So some dabbling ducks will dive and some diving ducks will dabble. Just depends. Um, next is where's the white? So looking at the placement of white feathers uh, is one of the easiest ways to ID uh, ducks over a long distance and in variable uh, lighting conditions. 
So if you can identify where the white placement is, um, like they're doing here in this little graphic, um, your chances of IDing become much better um, versus trying to ID the, the green or the brown or differentiate the green wing teals green from its brown because that's hard when it gets into different lighting um, or at any type of distance. Um, so the next time you're out and about, try looking for the white place or the white feathers. Um, it's a really big help. Um, the other thing that you can do is look at beaks. So especially when you have a silhouette going, um, you'll notice that like for canvas backs, their beak tends beaks tend to make them look a little more triangular um, versus the northern northern shuttler, which has a very wide um, kind of curvy beak. Um, it's pretty unmistakable, um, and then once you get that beak difference down, um, it becomes a lot easier to tell them apart from mallards, which was my original challenge, because um, mallards and northern shovelers are both very big ducks. Um, and then mergansers kind of have more of a cormorant style bill, um, where it's a little more straight, narrow, and pointier. Head shape can also help, so with the ring neck duck, it's a little more um, higher and pointed. Um, versus uh, the wood duck, which has a little more of an elongated head, uh, as well as the hooded merganser because of those uh, crest feathers. And when a hooded merganser male is in its full like display, it's unmistakable. You will never mistake them for a different bird. Uh -huh. And then finally, tail shape. Um, so for northern pintails, they have a really long, sh uh, long tail. For ruddy ducks, they have a very acute angled tail, and then mallards actually have a little curly tail, if, if you can kind of see. It's, it's subtle, but um, once you notice it, it helps differentiate it. So it's the tail the white part? The tail is actually just above the white part. So the curly part above? Yes. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Um, oh, and then finally, size. So size is really helpful if you have a bunch of different uh, ducks all together. Um, so these are mallards. Mallards tend to be pretty large ducks. And then that's a green winged teal, which tends to be on the smaller side. Um, also on the smaller side are gonna be like coots. Um, coots are really easy to ID because they move in a very light back and forth way. They're very cute, they're my favorite. Um, and then um, buckle heads also tend to be pretty small. Excellent, so we've gone over that. <laughs> uh, then we have falcons. So this little guy is a male kestrel. Um, he's going to be our little uh, token falcon for today, but we do have um, five different uh, falcon species here in Montana. Uh, falcons tend to be pretty small with round, short heads, um, and their wing shape can vary, but for open country hunters like we predominantly have here in Montana, they tend to have long pointed wings. Um, they also tend to be reversed sexual dimorphism, so Females tend to be larger than males. Um, and kestrels especially are pretty cool because they are um, not only year-round residents here, um, often found perching on, on wires. If you drive down a highway, um, it's 50-50. It's going to 50% it's going to be a uh, dove, and 50% it's going to be a kestrel. Um, but uh, they're really cool because they use wind hovering. So they're the only bird of prey that can um, and they use that um, rather than hummingbirds, which use their rapid wing beats to hover, um, they use the wind patterns to kind of position themselves. And um, they can do it with such precision that their head remains completely still and in place, um, which really improves their um, uh, hunting efficiency. So again, that energy specialization, um, that's what these guys can do. Then let's talk grebes. So um, here in Montana, we have several different grebe species. Um, that's a pied bill grebe, and then this is a western grebe. Uh, they're diving water birds with countershaded plumage, um, and their legs are placed far back on the body, which indicates what? Diving. Yes, that they're powerful divers. Um, it does decrease their maneuverability on land, though. So give and take, right? That evolutionary trade-off. Um, they tend to prey on fish, aquatic insects, crustaceans, mollusks, and small vertebrates. Um, and based on the beaks of these two different uh, species, what do you think 
what do you think their diet is like? Top one is probably more like mollusks and stuff. Yeah, exactly. So the pikeville group preys a lot more on like crayfish and mollusks, so things that have a hard shell, and that requires that deeper beak. Um, whereas the western group tends to have more fish and needs that long beak to grab the fish. Hawks, kites, and eagles. So we have 11 species in Montana. These are considered keystone predators. Um, and who knows what a keystone species is? Good indicator of how the species of prey spawn is doing. Yeah, so a keystone predator usually adapts to the level of population that its, its prey has. Um, but a keystone species we usually define as one that has a disproportionately large effect on its natural environment relative to its abundance. Um, so these tend to be predators that are few in number, but have a very large impact on their much more abundant prey. Um, and by that extension, um, they also affect what their prey affects. Um, so these guys uh, tend to regulate prey populations of small mammals, of smaller birds, of fish, and reptiles. Um, and then they have broad wings, strong hooked beaks, uh, strong legs and feet for grasping prey, and their wings might have fingers, and those fingers um, are long outer primary feathers, and it reduces the drag that they experience on their wings and allows them to soar at slower speeds without uh, stalling out. Um, Many species rely on trees for nesting, perching, roosting, and hunting. Um, and while they largely select habitat based on food availability, uh, the more trees that are available in a habitat, the more uh, raptor diversity uh, that can be found there. Um, they're largely threatened by DDT, although that was mostly during the 1940s to the 1960s where DDT really um, had their greatest effect. Um, nest disturbance and then lead poisoning. Um, what do you think these two birds are? This is actually both bald eagles. Um, so this is the juvenile coloration of a bald eagle. This lasts until about two to three years, I believe. Um, and then this is the adult plumage. Um, females are going to be larger than the males. Um, and so I mistook a juvenile female bald eagle for a golden eagle and got emailed by one of the Audubon people and was like, your eBird record is incorrect. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, bald eagles are also notorious opportunistic kleptoparasites. And so kleptoparasites um, are animals that steal food from other animals. Um, obligate obli obligate uh, kleptoparasites, um, they do this as their way of getting food and they have to do it because they don't have another good way of getting food. Um, bald eagles are just opportunistic, so they can hunt for their own prey, but oftentimes they steal it from ospreys. Um, one of my friends who is uh, both a rehabber and an ecologist, um, she says we, can, we have to make sure that the ospreys uh, never go extinct because who would feed our bald eagles? <laughs> Speaking of ospreys, um, ospreys are really cool birds. Um, they're pretty common here in Montana um, now that they're population has recovered um, after a pretty sharp decline. Um, they are a summer breeding, breeding resident here in Montana. They're large but smaller than bald eagles, um, and they have long narrow wings that are bent at the wrist when soaring, so they kind of look like a W. Um, and it appears two-toned, so kind of white towards the front and darker towards the back. Um, they tend to plunge feet first into water to capture their prey, um, and their feet are specially adapted with two toes in the front and two toes in the rear to better uh, um, maneuver their prey um, in the air. Um, and then they tend to build nests on dead, broken top trees or atop man made structures like power poles. And power poles are, in a sense, uh, dead, broken top trees, which creates a problem because they tend to build nests on top of those power lines. Um, which can cause fires, uh, which both pose a danger to people as well as to the birds themselves. Um, fires can potentially kill young or destroy the eggs um, and cause power outages. And so, um, as a solution, uh, power companies as well as a lot of conservation organizations have begun building osprey nests 
uh, which are basically just platforms that are very similar to power lines and power poles, uh, but without the power. Um, and sometimes they'll include a little perch so that ospreys can get away from their young and take a break. Um, and so power companies will go in and haze ospreys away from nests that they're trying to build on active power poles, and then try to redirect them to platforms if those are in the area. Um, sometimes ospreys are really, really determined to keep that same um, nest. Uh, there was an example, I think this one is an example of, of some uh, an osprey that had their nest catch on fire and then tried to build the nest again in the same exact place. Um, so they finally just built a platform on top of that and insulated the wires, which ospreys don't have the most brain cells of all the birds, so we have to sometimes just kind of cater to them. Now we have hummingbirds. So we have several species of hummingbirds here in Montana, the broad-tailed and the rufous being species of concern. Um, they feed primarily on nectar, so that's 90% of their diet, and 10% of their diet is supplemented by insects. Um, and they can drink their entire body weight in nectar in less than a day, um, which, I mean, considering the smallest is two grams, that's not a ton of nectar, but for them, proportionate to what they are, I mean, that would be like us drinking our body weight in mango juice in less than a day. Um, I can do it, but it would hurt. Um, <laughs> So um, these guys have a really, really high metabolism, and that's because of how fast their wings, uh, their wings beat and how fast their heart beats. Um, so their heart rates can reach 1,000 beats per minute during activity, um, and their wing beats in the smallest of hummingbirds can be up to 80 beats per second, um, and for the largest hummingbirds, 10 beats per second, um, which is insane to think about. Um, so, and that humming noise is caused by modified outer primary feathers, and that's what creates that little humming, which can become quite annoying if you have quite a few of them in your house. Um, and because of that high metabolism, sometimes they enter torpor during the night, um, either because they weren't able to get enough energy um, through nutrients during the day, or because it's become or the or because the temperatures dipped under freezing. And so, by entering torpor which we talked about, I believe, in mammalogy, um, it allows them to lower their body temperature and lower that heart rate. Um, and so they are going through a lot less energy than decreasing their um, energy demands. Um, so that's a really cool adaptation that they have. Um, they are threatened by habitat loss, uh, glass collisions, invasive species, and pesticides. We have swifts, which are actually closely related to hummingbirds. Um, more closely related to them than swallows, even though swifts are more often confused with swallows than hummingbirds, obviously. Um, I think they look like little flying cigars, uh, which is the easiest way to recognize them when they're in flight. Um, and they are in flight quite a bit. Um, they spend very little time on the ground, uh, particularly because they have very tiny feet, um, just like hummingbirds. Uh, hummingbirds and swifts share the same name, um, or same root, Latin root name, uh, which I believe means no feet um, or feetless. Um, and so they are adapted for high speed flight and for remaining aerial for quite some time and then roosting or landing in caves, cliffs, hollows, and um, they'll do that, they'll climb upwards on those, on those ledges using modified, uh, uh, modified feathers on their tails and then on their wings. So that's pretty cool. Um, and then they form nests through their saliva. Um, so they use saliva as glue, um, which is similar to what swallows do. So that's an example of a black swift nest within a cliff. Um, they tend to be social. They can form roosts, um, some of which are as large as, uh, or there's a couple in Oregon that are estimated to be like 20 to 30,000 uh, individuals strong. Um, which is pretty amazing. Um, they, can, they can also go into torpor on cold nights, just like hummingbirds. Um, they are insectivorous, and they are threatened by reduced uh, stream flow. So that can be caused by reduced snowpack, by early spring thaw, um, and they're also threatened by increased recreational activities near their nesting sites, so like uh, rock climbing 
or some increased um, floating like we have in Montana near uh, cliff sides. I'm just going to keep going with species until we're almost done. Actually, I have to skip ahead a couple times. Okay, so if anybody wants this presentation, let me know and I'll email it to you because it has a few more, um, including like kingfishers, loons, night jars, which are really cool. They have like frog mounts um, and they blend in super well. Um, owls, which I'm going to talk about owls really quick. Um, so we have 14 species in, in Montana. Um, they are defined by well-developed well talons, really soft plumage, strong legs, uh, facial discs, which kind of act like a, um, a satellite disc when it comes to their hearing. Uh, they have excellent hearing and they have excellent night vision and they have completely silent flight. And that silent flight is created by um, the leading edge of their wing being shaped like a cone and the trailing edge having a fringe, and together that funnels air smoothly over the wing, over that really soft plumage, um, and it dampens the sound. So that's an example of, of the wings, and that's why you can see this huge bird flying through the air and it being completely silent, which is incredible to see. Um, they can rotate their necks 270 degrees, not all the way around, like you might believe through like cartoons as a kid. Um, they have to rotate their neck because of the way their eyes are structured. So those um, sclerotic uh, rings, which are the little areas at their eyes, um, they're kind of like cones, and they support these huge eyes, which take up, honestly, most of their skull. Their brains are not big. They're mostly eyes. Um, and so because of that uh, sclerotic uh, ring, they can't move their eyes like we can. So they can't look to the sides. So they have to rotate their entire head. Otherwise, they'd be expending energy by rotating their entire body. Um, they do have amazing uh, camouflage called cryptic coloration. Um, and there are three different images up here, um, one and two, and then a before and after here. So see if you can spot the owl. Let's see if I can do laser pointer. Okay, so there's an owl here. That's a screech owl. There's an owl here. And then there's an owl right here. Um, owls are really hard to see as a birder because you can be st like standing right under it and not see it. Um, I usually have to have like expert birders who walk up to me and they're like, oh, look up, there's an owl. And I've been standing here for like 10 minutes and didn't see it. Um, so if somebody comes and tells you um, that there's an owl around, go and see it. Like, that's a really cool opportunity. I've gone with many like random strangers who have walked out of the woods with big binoculars and said, do you want to see an owl? And it's like, am I being kidnapped or am I going to see an owl? It doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah, they warned you about what, like asking if you want candy as a kid? This is the new thing. Do you want to see an owl? Um, so these are Missoula's hotspots, which will be one of our last topics. Um, this can be found on Eber. So if you want a cool resource just to see what species are around, what people are seeing at any given time that they're logging, uh, download eBird, create an account, um, and go and see what's, what's around. Um, Kelly Island is really cool. Uh, Tower Street Open Space is really great. Um, I've seen owls at Tower Street Open Space and then the Clay Flats, which is where I saw a great gray owl, which is like the highlight of my like, time here in Montana. Um, but we have so many cool spaces, like so close to central Missoula to see cool birds. So I really encourage you guys to go and explore all these areas. Um, and these are some extra resources for learning more about ornithology. Uh, Cornell's Bird Academy, you can take a bird biology course that is like in-depth. I think it's like $200, but it's a good course. Um, there's a bunch of other classes that they teach that are more like $50 um, on like bird behavior, um, bird ecology, that type of thing. Um, eBird and Merlin are two apps that are essential for a beginning birder, um, or if you just like birds and want to see what's around. Merlin can ID through sound, which is really cool. Just makes you more aware of what's around. Um, the two Audubon societies, Five Valleys is more local. Montana is all the state. And then the Montana Field Guide website, which is my favorite website that the government of Montana has. 
Um, it will tell you all about every single species of bird that we have in Montana, including their range, their migration, their behavior, and then all the other animals and plants that we have in Montana as well. So it's really cool. It's maintained by the Heritage uh, Foundation. So that is all. Thank you for staying three minutes over time um, and for listening to me talk about birds. Are there any other questions? Oh, and before you leave, if you have been a consistent uh, attendee or if you plan on watching all of the videos that are on our YouTube channel, uh, the Missoula Public Library with YouTube channel, please come up and sign up for your certificate, which you will be receiving next class for your community naturalist status. So cool, thanks everyone. And let me know if you have any questions or if you need help using either of the apps. So that's all I got for you today.